markets did not like that inflation data. No, they did not like it whatsoever. And that, of course, was exactly what we were anticipating here as we were discussing this situation yesterday, the possibility that we might get the kind of soft inflation data that would get the markets looking a bit like the dog that caught the proverbial car. That having spent all of this time speculating on rate cuts and cheering them on, a level of immediacy in their arrival might actually spook investors because they would say, ah, well, if the rate cuts really are here, not somewhere three months ahead, but now, immediately on the horizon, well, that means that the Fed is being beckoned to act because of some sort of intolerable negativity in the economic outlook. And that's a recession risk. That, of course, was precisely what happened as the data crossed the wires today, giving us explosive losses uh, across the major indices. And the question we ask ourselves now is whether this is the beginning of a thing or whether we might be looking at something without immediate follow through. And the question that we necessarily then have to ask ourselves is what is it that might give stocks their next leg lower or alternatively give them a bit of a reprieve as we head into the end of the week and the spotlight seems to fall on U.S. consumers. So what we're going to do here, and of course, this is Macro Money. I'm Ilya Spivak, head of Global Macro here at Tasty Live. Uh, what we're going to do as we dissect this story is, first of all, see what happened with inflation, see how it's impacted the markets, and then see if the next big piece of the story, the University of Michigan Consumer Confidence report due with us before the end of the week, what that might do to shift this narrative this way or that. And of course, consider why. So here's how things went with inflation. The core rate here, that which approximates the inflation stuck, as we can see here in the service sector, since goods are at this, uh, at this point a negative contribution to inflation and the situation in energy and in food is essentially negligible. That's down to 3.3%. The expectation was that it would hold at 3.4% percent unchanged from May. We got a downtick today, giving us a new three-year low. What's more, the headline number comes down uh, and uh, gives us 3%. That would be uh, another major milestone. That's the lowest in a year. And so uh, clearly here, uh, the market's giving us the kind of thing that would make the Fed more confident to lower interest rates and the markets of course respond accordingly so here is that chart that we've been watching for uh, weeks on end now that relates the path of the s p 500 as a kind of stand-in for overall stock market mood to what is going on with fed policy expectations as they are baked into fed funds futures for this year next year and cumulatively over that period of time. And so what we see here is very interesting. Since the middle of April, so about three months now, the stock market has rebounded and of course uh, has shown a very spirited rally from this low onward. As the markets were readjusting to a perspective from uh, the Fed that was kind of frustrated with disinflation having stalled over the course of February, March, and 
April to some extent, looking at the uh, Fed's favored PCE measure of uh, poor inflation, and saying, look, uh, we want to be cutting. We think r rates are high enough, but if inflation isn't continuing to progress lower, we can't be cutting soon. So we're going to be able to do fewer cuts this year than we thought. And ultimately, in June, the Fed adjusted its um, forecasting from three cuts this year to one. What we see in the gray bars here for 2024 is that since mid-April, we've been sitting at about one cut for this year. But how the markets interpreted the delay is to say, well, the Fed should already be cutting. They're going to be late. And so what they're going to do is have to do a degree of catch up. Next year, they're going to have to cut more and cut harder than if they had started earlier. That they're behind the ball now on the easing cycle as they were behind the ball on the rate hike cycle by the middle of 2021 when the Fed finally admitted as much and started to set the stage for a big round of rate hikes. So what we got over these three months, which was, of course, so very supportive for stock markets, was not only a shifting of rate cuts into next year, but an expansion of those rate cuts from a cumulative 75, 76 basis points, three cuts, to 130, 132 basis points, five rate cuts with some uh, modest likelihood of a sixth. What we got with the CPI release today, as we can clearly see, did not move the overall tally very much. 132, 133 basis points continues to be the, uh, the consensus view. But the mix from 2025 to 2024 has changed. If we look closely right here, we can see the markets are now baked in for two cuts this year. And since the tally didn't change, that had to come from next year's total. In other words, the markets read today's data to mean rate cuts aren't necessarily going to be bigger in scope, but they're coming sooner because a sense of urgency has entered into the equation. So what we see now, looking at Fed Fund's futures probabilities, is that a rate cut is fully priced in now for September. No move is expected at this month's meeting still uh, on uh, the 31st of July. Ostensibly, something would have to uh, go very much awry in incoming economic data for that to uh, suddenly become something like an emergency cut within just a couple of weeks here. But the market is, at this point, thoroughly convinced that at least one cut is coming in September. What's more, by December, the probability of a second cut is now 56%. So slightly better than even odds that we're going to get a second cut before the calendar turns to 2025, which is the most dovish that this has looked for this year, for the better part, as we say, of three months. Not surprisingly, the market looked at this and said, okay, this is not soft landing. There will be rate cuts at some point, but growth is still well-supported kind of a story. This now is the Fed is getting worried about growth. Inflation is falling faster than expected to validate those concerns. Now we need to be thinking about whether it makes sense that risk-sensitive and cyclical assets like stocks are at least at the benchmarks, like the S&P 500 or the NASDAQ, sitting at record highs at a time when some sort of a recession risk appears so acute that the Fed will now almost certainly begin a rate cut cycle at the meeting after next. And indeed, we see here why the market 
was so adamant that the Fed was getting it wrong. Why did the market go here from 80 basis points to nearly double that? Because since mid-April, we can see U.S. economic data has increasingly underperformed relative to forecasts. And we see this, of course, in spades when we look at the latest uh, approximation of the trend in GDP that comes from the, uh, the PMI numbers that were released from the uh, Institute of Supply Management. And we see that they were woefully disappointing. Not so much on the manufacturing side, where we got a little bit faster contraction than we, we were expecting, but ultimately no big shock. The service sector, which is the overwhelming majority of the economy, was expected to give us relatively healthy growth and instead gave us the first contraction since December of 2022, unexpectedly. So it does seem like in june there was some sort of particularly adverse uh, adverse pivot in the business cycle in fact looking at the uh, gdp now cast a kind of uh, live running forecast for gdp from the atlanta fed we can see that just over the past week week and a half there has been a sharp revision lower by a full percentage point on net in GDP growth expectations. So the markets might be forgiven for, for saying, well, if the rate cuts really are this imminent, then we are now in the part of the story where we're worried about growth. And that does not comport with the risk on attitude in financial markets, which is going to bring us to this uh, piece of consumer confidence data. Now, inflation expectations are very clearly the driving narrative here since the beginning of 2021. We can see exactly what is occurring. As inflation expectations build into the Fed's belated realization that they're going to be sticky, consumer confidence is declining. That shouldn't be surprising. Uh, we have a situation where consumers are saying, well, the price of things is rising. Surely that's not good news. And not only is it rising now, but expectations for where things will be a year from now, those are rising. And that's not good for uh, consumers' assessment of, of current conditions or of their uh, forward expectations. So we see this steady decline here, which very tellingly bottoms out once inflation expectations crest. Now, this, of course, is the first half of 2022, which we know is when the Fed begins its rate hike cycle. And as it does, inflation expectations start to decline. As they do, consumer sentiment begins a trend toward improvement. And we can see with the naked eye here the level of sensitivity in consumer confidence to these one-year inflation expectation moves. When there is a pop in inflation expectations along the way down here, sentiment cools. When that inflation expectations run up fizzles, sentiment improves. Here and here and here again. We notice, uh, of course, that most recently, start of this year. This is that period of a frustrated Fed concern that disinflation has run in, into a wall. As we get some stasis here, even with a little bit of a notch up in inflation expectations, sentiment dips. But of course, in recent months, as we now see in spades, inflation has started to decrease again. Indeed, what this is here now, the report we just got for June, is a continuation of May and is unpointed departure from the standstill that we get right here. This inflation, stall, resumption. And so the question here now, of course, is 
if consumers are so ahead of the game on identifying where inflation expectations are going, surely they've noticed. And so surely inflation expectations in this report might be biased to surprise lower. The expectation, of course, is that we're going to get a restatement at 3%, but that might be heading southward now. In line, of course, with what's been happening in U.S. numbers overall. But this, of course, raises a very important question. Lower inflation expectations have been a boon for consumer uh, confidence, as we can see here. But that's because the economy has remained relatively resilient. So lower numbers on inflation just mean that in a relatively better economy, the cost of living is rising at an increasingly slower rate, or at the very least, the rate at which it's rising is rebasing to something that is more tolerable than when the expectation was that it would be growing at 5%. So not surprisingly, that's been cheered on by consumers. But if the reason that inflation is coming down now is becoming increasingly about more and more acute economic weakness, is this still something that consumers can reasonably cheer? Because now the question becomes, well, yeah, the level of prices might be rising slower, but what if we start to see marked job losses? What if we start to see a big loss of demand for small business, et cetera, et cetera. And so the key here starts to be what happens if this dynamic is going to break down? If we get lower inflation expectations, but sentiment doesn't improve as a consequence, and as a matter of fact, ticks lower. If that's how this is going to go, then indeed we are facing more likely than not some sort of a deeper downturn in the business cycle because that business cycle depends intimately on what consumers feel and what they do. Three quarters, give or take, of U.S. economic growth is private household consumption. So if consumers are no longer cheered by lower inflation because that inflation now comes at the cost of growth, well, then we have still more validation of exactly the panicked perspective that the markets looked at when they saw the inflation numbers coming out earlier today. As a matter of fact, this comes amid a longer term deterioration in the way that economic data from uh, all around the world has looked, both developed markets and emerging markets coming together on the total. We can see that emerging markets here crested a bit later, around May, and then economic data out of there started to deteriorate. Uh, the cresting was a little bit earlier for developed markets, and um, of course, with them, the overall total. And this makes sense. Because, of course, developed markets did a lot more stimulus through the pandemic, had a much bigger inflation issue as a consequence thereafter, and so have done much more to rein in growth to hike rates as a follow-on policy response. So it would make sense that some sort of economic downturn would strike the developed markets first. And because those developed markets tend to be the sources of demand for the emerging markets, the emerging markets tend to be vendors for rich world demand and dependent on it, that there would be a level of sequencing. Developed markets would deteriorate first, and there would be a, a knock-on effect to emerging markets with some lag. The character of this as 
not just concern about the U.S., but the world economy as a whole, comes in this very structure. We can see here, 50% of global GDP is just three economies, the Eurozone, China, and the U.S. Now, we just got data this week uh, reconfirming that China is woefully anemic on the economic growth front and has been all through uh, the latter part of COVID and since they've exited their zero COVID restrictions. They've still not been able to get back up off the map. Meanwhile, the Eurozone is once again coming undone on the growth front. They had a shallow recession late last year. There was a bit of a bounce from those growth lows in the first quarter and a little bit into the second quarter of this year. But the most recent PMI data suggests that has been exhausted and we are once again in deceleration mode in Europe. In fact, growth region-wide is again near standstill. So the U.S. was really the last leg of the stool because the other 50% depend on demand from the top three in order to be growing. And so if the U.S. really is starting to turn lower as the CPI numbers and the ISM numbers and perhaps the incoming University of Michigan numbers might suggest, well, then we're operating without a safety net. There is no offset. And so the risk is not just of U.S. recession, but of global recession with all of its dire consequences for financial stability, for economic performance, and so forth. So the way that these uh, consumer confidence numbers come out takes on a much more uh, acute importance here because how the U.S. consumer fares here will be representative not just of what the U.S. does, but of where the global economy is headed. And if that seems like it's heading downward, well, then stocks are going to have a hard time rallying and the U.S. dollar might rally uh, instead against all odds because capital is flooding into the safety of the most liquid currency unit. And that is macro money for today. As ever, we are here Monday through Thursday, right after Overtime, a show that I co-host with Dylan Radigan and Chris Vecchio, looking at the Wall Street close and what may follow thereafter. I'm back on with Chris tomorrow for Futures Power Hour to uh, digest what happens with this consumer confidence data and how the markets fare, so do come join for that. I'll be back on Sunday with uh, Victor Jones and Tom for First Call. Back on with Victor Wednesday for The Price of Truth. I'm also writing for the news and insights portion of tastylive.com and opining sporadically on the platform formerly known as Twitter at Ilya Spivak. Thanks very much for joining. Happy trading.